Good evening. I'm Selwyn Collins, your host of CWS Conversations with Selwyn. Thank you for joining us this evening. And those of you who are joining us for the first time, a very special thank you. I could not do this without your support. CWS is about having conversations with people about their journey and how they're using their gifts and talents to help others. And so I am always looking for people who are doing extraordinary things or doing things extraordinarily well. I believe that each of us has a story to tell. Imagine sharing your story and there's someone, could be a young person somewhere in the world, listening to you and being inspired, being motivated by your success, but also recognizing some similar challenges that you might have overcome. And imagine that person one day becoming the head of state, becoming a geneticist, an oncologist, someone who discovers a vaccine that saves millions of lives. If you have an idea, commit to it. Some will laugh at you, some will mock you, some will scorn you, some will tell you it is not possible, but it is not theirs to tell. I leave you on that note. I'll take a break, and when I return, I'll introduce you to, well, I leave it, and when I return. We are back. Those of you joining us for the first time, I'm Selwyn Collins, your host of CWS Conversations with Selwyn. The lovely lady next to me is Christine Franklin. Christine, good evening. Hi, Selwyn. How are you? I am fine, thank you. I'm glad to have you here. Christine, I, I want to start a little bit. I want to start with your bio, um, just snippets of it, and then we'll get started. Okay. As the, as the president of one of the fastest, fastest growing minority owned firms in the nation, Ms. Franklin is responsible for steering and directing the accomplishment of the firm's mission of best value. From assisting clients in the formulation of major projects to implementing the firm's strategic plan, she's in charge of ensuring that the firm fulfills its obligations to the stakeholders, namely its clients, employees, and the community. CEI has received many accolades since she had been at the helm from an outstanding performance award from the Department of Homeland Security, as well as the Gold Medal Business Achievement Award from the prestigious Environmental Business Journal. This year, on its 15th anniversary, the forum has also placed 15th on the list of the top women-led business in Florida for 2014. In addition to being a Florida registered professional engineer and a building contractor, Ms. Franklin has a Master's of Business Administration from the University of Florida. She is a member of the National Society of Professional Engineers, American Society of Civil Engineers, and the Florida Engineering Society. Some awards that CEI has gratefully and graciously accepted include the Environmental Business Journal, EBJ 2014 Business Achievement Awards, the United States Department of Homeland Security Small Business Achievement Award for Outstanding Performance, U.S. Small Business Administration Administrators Award for Excellence, the Commonwealth Institute, Top Women-Led Business in Florida, Southeast Construction Magazine, Top Specialty Contractors, South Florida Business Journal, Top 25 Engineering Forms, Greater Miami Chamber of Commerce, Top 100 minor Minority-Owned Businesses, Florida International University, 25 Women to Watch, Hispanic Business Magazine, 100 Fastest Growing Companies, Zweig White Letter Hot Form, Fastest Growing AEP and Environmental Consulting Forms in the U.S. and Canada, Inc. 5000, Fastest Growing Private Companies in America. Amazing. Amazing. I want to get right into it, Christine. You were born in Guyana. Can, can you give us a glimpse into that world as a 10-year-old, a 15-year-old, and who you became at 21? 
Okay, uh, Guyana at 10 years old, um, just before you're 10, you have to take an exam that determines uh, the, the high school that you go to. So just before 10, you're busy preparing for that examination. I remember going to Bedford Methodist School and um, really liking our, um, our headmaster who took a special interest to in me because I wasn't paying too much attention to, um, to common entrance. But anyway, fortunately, I passed and went to Bishop's High School, which to me was one of the most amazing experiences of my life and which totally transformed who I was at the time to help me become who I am today. And that experience exposed me to a lot of the friendships that I maintain today, I know that we have our reunion in July. I'm looking forward to seeing lots of people there. Uh, so the 10-year-old person was the person preparing for the transition to teenagehood. The 15-year-old person was the person trying very hard to separate from, from your parents, from your mother especially, because you know, as a child, when you're a child, your mother is your hero. And at 15, you have to form your own identity. So at 15 is the time you start getting into trouble. You start to identify more with your peers and, um, and you try to form an identity. Uh, by 21, I had, I had completely gone past that. I was 21 going on 40, ready to take on the whole world. I, was, I had just, I think, graduated my, with my degree in engineering and uh, had started to work in Guyana at um, GNEC and um, ready to take on the world. So that was my transition from 10 to 21. What is the fondest memory of your parents as a child? My, fa my parents, um, I, my parents were divorced when I was quite young. And so I don't have a lot of memory of them being together. But I do have a memory of my father separately and my mom separately. My father was one of those people who, uh, unlike most parents in Guyana, didn't believe in corporal punishment at all. So he never touched us. And I remember one time, um, I think, can't remember what we did. We did something very stupid and he had a popsicle stick. And he used that popsicle stick to just give us a pat. And we just were so alarmed. We were bawling and he kept apologizing profusely. That was that to me. Um, and the more he kept apologizing was the more we were bawling because we, even as kids, realized that we had the upper hand there. That was the form, fondest memory. And the fondest memory of my, of my mom was not a good one, really. It was um, my sister and I were, were fishing, went fishing, and we fell into a pond. And we were drowning in this pond and we um somebody was passing on a bicycle jumped into the pond fully clothed pulled us out of the pond and we ran home expecting um sympathy from her but she unfortunately was the other end of the scale who believed in corporate punishment so after she threw us in the shower and got us cleaned up she just whipped us for falling into the pond so those are my memories of my parents that uh, i remember fondly can you, can you tell us what, what you miss most about being 15? I miss um, probably how carefree that world was, how, how, how you so totally lived for the present. It was all about makeup and clothes and boys and somebody else took care of all of the major issues in your life and you just look forward to the next, the next day, the next event that I'm getting together with your friends. So um, life was, life was simpler at 15, except of course for all the hormonal changes that were happening to you as a, as a 15 year old. But it, it was simple and it was, it was perfect. I, I loved my teenage years. Who, who would you say outside of your parents has had um, the greatest impact on you as a child? As a child, my the greatest impact, I would say my aunt. 
most of my friends who some of whom are watching now because I, I literally told everybody that I was gonna be on your show tonight Selwyn. Oh really? <laughs> so my friends are watching and um, I have a special aunt that everybody calls Auntie Babsy and uh, she has been in my life forever. She has been the person who's been my rock of Gibraltar through everything that has gone, gone on, you know, you know. She's always been there, always been the shoulder to cry on, always been the, the, the person that you can completely depend on. And she turned 96 this year, and um, she's still that person for me. She wow. lives with me, and she still takes care of me. She still looks out for me, so wow. that's my hero. I, I, I want to spend a little, little time on your early time, you know, early timeline for, for, you know, for a bit, just so I can, well, let me just say this. I, I believe that many, many, many people are, ge are gems, and you are certainly a gem of our soil, and a gem has many facets. So I'm, I'm hoping that we can twist this gem a little bit and expose the other facets during these conversations. So by the end of the conversation, we have a multi-dimensional um, perspective of who you are. So indulge me a bit. Okay. Growing up in Guyana, what sort of colors and sounds, when, when you think of Guyana, what sort of colors and sounds come to mind? Oh, the colors of Guyana are so vibrant. I remember the, you know, the yellows of the buttercup and the hibiscus and the scarlet ibis. I actually went to Guyana three years ago uh, when I took my mother's ashes back. And I forgot how amazingly vibrant Guyana is mm -hmm. compared even to the rest of the Caribbean because there is such a plethora of, of, of birds and flowers and fruit and even even people and colors and, and, and races and I mean the diversity we we I think we invented the whole word diversity as the land of six peoples. Oh. It's Guyana is amazing. You mentioned your mother and, and uh, the, the corporal punishment you got, you and your sister got for nearly having drowned. Um, I want to ask you this. If you, if you were to eavesdrop a conversation uh, with your mom and your sister talk, telling a stranger a story, uh, or a story about you, what do you think, start with your mom force, they would say? Well, my mother... God, God rest her soul. Like I said, it's, um, you know, it's always been, for my mom and me, me and my mom, my sister, it's always kind of like been the three of us against the world. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, you have all the family and extended family, but it's when those doors close that, you know, that, that, that's your real, um, that's your real support system. Um, my mom would really be extremely, extremely proud of me. And, and who I've become um, and, and what I am today. Because I always remember as a, as a child, she would come into my room and she would look at the mess and she would say, I would never ever visit your house when you become an adult. <laughs> and um, she spent the last 18 months of her life with me. And I, uh, I, don't, if I have this pristine house, I guess because I have somebody that helps me clean it. But, um, and I'm, I, I always smile to myself, so I think she would be kind of be surprised at just, just how, how, how structured and how well-rounded a person I had become. My sister, my sister, my sister has always been another one of my heroes, and I have been, I, I, I was always hers too, you know, we've always strived to be each other. And I think she would say how extremely proud of um, of all of, of everything that I've accomplished and nothing I've done I've done in my own steam. It's all all because of the people that I've been surrounded by, the support I've gotten by my friends and my family and my sister especially has always been my biggest advocate. And um, she died unfortunately suddenly in um, last July. It's not been a year yet, you um, know. But she's been she would she would say she is tremendously proud of me. Who who are some 
Who are some other women that inspire you? Other women that inspired me, uh, the people, the teachers at school, there were, a lot, there were lots of teachers that I was inspired. They did a lot of wonderful things for me. Um, I remember us having, a very, for a very short time, I had um, a headmistress, her name was Miss Durer, and she was a tiny lady, but she had such a presence. She just had to walk down the corridor and the entire school became silent. It was amazing. And it's, as a child, I wondered exactly how she could do that. Because there were teachers that would come and yell and scream and nobody would listen. But she, she just looked at you. And you were in awe of her. Uh, that was one person. And another one in school was um, Terry, who um, took it upon herself to... to help educate us when we when we weren't getting it physics the entire class was um was failing in physics and so she just chose me and another another person and she took us to her house every weekend and taught us and we came back and we taught the class uh there's so many inspiring women in um i i want Indiana. to i want to slip into the chat room a little bit and read some comments Roxanne, lovely pics, but Selwyn's intro too long. <laughs> Car <laughs> oh, that's funny. Caroline, congratulations, Christine. I'm looking forward to this interview. Brenda Richards, Christine, I have recently read Cherokee Corp nomination for the Minority Owned Business Award in the Miami Herald. Congratulations on that achievement and continued success to you and your colleague. Brenda Richards, oh, by the way, yes, I am watching and have some questions for later. Roxanne, Christine, your resume is so impressive. So proud to know you. I didn't, I didn't even know half of those accomplishments. So the next question... Um, I told you there were all my friends watching here. <laughs> well, I'm glad to have <laughs> so they're, them. They're just going to say nice things. I, I, I'm going to ask you to indulge me a hypothetical. Mm -hmm. It's a long weekend, and you decided to do some me time and go somewhere where it is sunny and warm. It's a place where you can sit in the shade beneath your favorite tree to read a book, sip your favorite drink, and listen to some music. Where would this place be? What will you be reading? What will you be drinking? And what music will you be listening to? Okay. Hmm. I would jump on a plane and I would fly to Labrie, a place in St. Lucia, where my brother-in-law and my sister, they have this amazing, amazing respite. Uh, there is a little beach just down, um, down the hill from the house. I would go down there with my favorite drink, which is of course wine. You cannot be in the Caribbean and not listen to uh, reggae. So it will be Marley or Tosh or one of those really soft reggae um, people. And I will be munching on my favorite of the Caribbean again is selfish fritters and listen to, listening to the water lap of the ocean. And hopefully I'd have my family around me as well. The book. Something easy and and spiritual, like something by Eckhart Tolle, maybe The Power of Now. Okay. Or, I like that's, that. That's, that. That would be my dream. I like that. Moment. In the 2008 presidential campaign, what did it feel like to see a woman, Hillary Clinton, come so close to winning the nomination for president of the United States? I I know there there I, I swear it was there were all of these Hillary supporters and as much as I I'm a Hillary supporter right now um, I I couldn't I couldn't help but want Barack Obama to win the nomination I did not think he would I voted for Barack Obama expecting to um, waste my vote but I just wanted to vote for him. But I think it was an, a tremendous accomplishment on Hillary's part. Um, I, th I know that there was a wave that was carrying Barack Obama and it was just unfortunate that she chose to run against him. Uh, but 
I, I really hope that she decides to run this time. I, I, I sincerely hope she decides to run this time. Well, it, it would be unfair for me not to ask you the next question. What did it feel like on Inauguration Day watching the first black president of the United States? It, oh, I had an Inauguration Day party, actually. So it was, it was, it was well planned, but a lot of, um, you know, I, I brought a lot of uh, giveaways for my guests. We cooked a special meal um, to celebrate the day. We had, um, we had special music. And it was, I don't, I don't know that it was something that I ever thought that I would live to see. I, I know there are most Americans didn't think they would live to see. And it was actually one of the proudest moments of my life for being black and also for being American. Hmm. Um, yeah, uh, before. Uh, what I had done just before election day, I had voted and I had gone to St. Lucia because it was my nephew's wedding. And every person in the world, because it's a tourist island and every tourist was telling me they wish they can vote. All of the little huts in St. Lucia, up in the hills, in the mountains, they all had pictures of Barack Obama. It was, it was, it was an occasion, it was a world event. So I think, I think, I think it was the proudest moment for a lot of people in the world, knowing that we had, at least for a, for a moment, risen above all of our differences and put in place the person that we thought that we thought at the time was the best person for the job. Of all the awards your your company Cherokee Enterprises Inc. received. Which of them surprised you, and which of them are you most proud? The one that um, I'm most proud of is the one that um, we got from the Department of Homeland Security for outstanding performance. That that's, that was a national award, mm -hmm. and a lot of um, a lot of businesses were submitted that year. I think that was in 2009. And we won that hands down. We had to go to Washington D.C. to collect that award, and you know we were um, we were celebrated for winning for winning that award, that achievement. But some of the um, some of the simpler ones, the ones that don't get a lot of attention, the ones that we get from our community for community involvement, um, the ones that we don't um, we don't showcase that much. I guess I'm not sure why. Uh, those are the ones that are closest to my heart, really and truly, because we, we um, community involvement is one of the core values of our firm. And we go out and we do a lot of it. Um, and um, we get these plaques and, and, and thank you letters and, and certificates. And those to me are closest to my heart. Did, did you always, did you always had a desire to run your own company? And what is the trigger that led you down that path? No, I, I was not an entrepreneurial person. I came from a family where, you know, you you worked for a living, you went to school, you earned a degree, you, you got a good job, you got married, you got children, and, and you lived a good life, and you, um, and you, do, you do that. I, you, I never thought that I had, um, I had the courage, because uh, it takes courage to, to, to take that step. In retrospect, I realize that it takes less, less courage to work for yourself than to work for someone else because you have a lot more knowledge, you have a lot more of inside information as a business owner. Mm -hmm. So what you think is security is really a false sense of security. You have more security owning your own business because you, you can charge your own course. But, but the trigger actually was I worked for a large multinational firm and they decided that they no longer wanted to have their Miami office. And they were going to collapse the office into the Boca office, and we were going to move to Boca. And uh, we approached our clients. We had some some pretty um, substantial clients. Coca Cola is one of our clients. Johnson and Johnson is a client. Uh, Miami Dade County is a client. And we we said, you know, if we started a firm, would you um, give us business? And they said, well, we deal with you right now. We don't know who your um, corporate office is. At the time, I just completed my MBA, so. 
the at, and I did the MBA at the University of Florida, and they they have like kind of entrepreneurial MBA, and they 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 kind of push you in that direction, and, and you have a paradigm shift that you can do this, you can understand financial statements, you know, um, you can do um, strategic planning, you can accomplish this. So that gave me the confidence that you know this is an opportunity that probably wouldn't ever come again in my life, and I need to seize it. Uh, it's not that I didn't have trepidation and I wasn't scared and I didn't get cold feet. But um, as I was talking to somebody who I consider my mentor, I asked him, I said, you know, I'm not sure that I'm doing the right thing. And he asked me one question. He said, um, what's the worst thing that can happen? And I said, well, the business can fail. And he said, and you can always get another job. And that kind of sealed it for me and we started in um, the end of 1999 and 15 years later here we are. Wow. Um, in the chat room Nazima London said that's not true we are saying thing nice things about you because it's all true. Sorela <laughs> I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. What challenges have you faced as a minority woman in business? What advice would you offer to a young woman? Okay, um, I always feel that in my weakness is my strength. That is a matter of mine. So any, you know, like the challenges of minority and as a woman, okay, you would figure that those are weaknesses and you have to find a way to turn, turn those around to be a strength. There will always be challenges. People will always find a, a, a reason to um, to discriminate. You know, there are people of, of the same race in the same country, and they find a means to to differentiate themselves. Uh, you have to you have to see how you can make those challenges work for you. As a minority, there are lots of um, programs that are set up that um, allow you to compete in a tighter marketplace. So if you go after those certifications and you win them, then it gives you a chance to grow your business while you're not competing in the, in the, in the, uh, with the bigger guys. Now we have graduated from, from, from those programs and um, so we've, we, we, you know, we've had to look for other um, competitive advantages. And as a woman, I mean, we bring so much to the table as a woman and of course um, there is there is um, discrimination against women as well, but um, what you do is you band forces with other women, and 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 you and you get your strengths from them. So, I am not intimidated by challenges. As a matter of fact, I look at challenges as opportunities. Mm -hmm. And um, Brenda Richard said yesterday was Earth Day. I read that Cherokee Corporation is involved with environmental concerns. What is within the realm of your company's priorities to improve the environment. What is in the realm of our company? Uh, let me question? repeat that. Let me repeat that. What is within the realm of your company's priorities to improve the environment? Okay. Well, um, one thing I must say for Earth Day, uh, we are Saturday. Our entire firm, we are going to. Um, clean up a park in Biscayne Bay. There were 61 people who were going out there and afterwards we're having a, a barbecue so if anybody's listening and want to join us, please do. Uh, we, um, our environment, that's, that's, that's what we do, environmental cleanup is one of our core competencies and we do the hard, the hard science and engineering. Environmental um, cleanup consists of the soft sciences, which is managing the, the flora and the fauna and the species and ensuring those species still exist and, and, and are perpetuated. And what we do, we do the hard sciences. We analyze your soil, your groundwater, all, you know, discover what the contaminants are and we design systems to remediate that contamination. We also install the systems, we monitor them we operate and uh, maintain them, we write the reports, and we get the closure. So um, that's, that's basically our contribution to, to um, ensuring that this planet survives.
forever. One question before, well, let me, let, me, let me read something from the chat room for us and then another question we go on a break. Pamela Joseph said, Christine, you are an inspiration to Guyanese women and also to all women in business. And the question before we go on a break is, your form's mission is best value. How, do you, how did you arrive at that principle as a primary focus for your company? Okay. Uh, the first thing is, uh, it took us four days to come up with the mission. And we did um, what the owners, what we do every year is that we isolate ourselves. And we went away and we went to an island, it's called Fisher Island. And to figure out what it is that we really want to achieve, accomplish, and what are our goals. And, and we work through a lot of, 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 of missions and to come up with something that, that made sense to all of us. It was a consensus that why are we here? Or why did we form this company? What it is that we want to accomplish? Because we, we all came from this large multinational firm. And we wanted to be able to provide the same level of service that that large firm provided because we knew what level of service was expected, but for small company prices. And the reason that they had to charge what they had to charge because they had an entire legal department, a huge marketing department, uh, a finance department that had hundreds of people. So if we can, for, if we can have this firm that didn't have all of those facets, but we can pull in those facets as we need to and did not have to carry an overhead, then we can do the same thing. So if we can have an attorney on retainer, we can have a CPA when we needed it, when, you know, those kinds of things, those people who understood our business then. Uh, um, so, that, so that's what we did. So we provide you the best value. And I we're not necessarily going to provide you the best price, but we provide you the best value. I want to leave you with this question, and when we return, we'll answer it. It's from Brenda Richards in the chat room. What are some of the concerns from a professional standpoint that keep you up at night? So when we get back, you could answer that. Thank you. <laughs> We are back with the lovely Christine Franklin. Christine, the question Brenda asked before the break is, what, what are some of your concerns from a professional standpoint that keep you up at night? Okay, that's a good question. Oh, very few things keep me up at night, actually. I sleep rather well. I bet, I know, I, I know exactly what she means. Um, what we do is not um, is not without risk. We work at airports. We work around fuel lines. We work with heavy equipment, and we have to be careful. Mm -hmm. So make sure that people stay safe. Um, the biggest thing is when people walk into my office with the with you know the sky is falling kind of look. I ask them all one question is everybody okay once everybody is okay we can deal with whatever problem that is we cannot deal with if somebody's been hurt but if some if everybody's okay we're fine so the thing that keeps me awake would be to make sure that everybody under my charge under my watch um, all the products that we have those are being done and they're done safely because it's very easy for somebody to get hurt in our business. Other than that, I, I, I have trust and faith that, that if, if, if you do the right thing, then the right thing will happen. 
What is the least helpful advice someone has ever given to you and, and how did that motivate you? The least helpful? Uh, yes, the least helpful advice someone has given you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Ah, least helpful advice. That's probably a lot of a lot of people. Um that you know when things are when things are going bad, like during the recession. Yes. The advice was to um to let people go to save money and um and, and hire them back when when things got better. Uh, we we actually thought that, that was really bad advice. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that it works in, a, in, a, in, and I don't think that your employees trust you. So no, I think that I think we thought that was bad advice. We we looked at it in the beginning, and after evaluating all of all of our options, we opted to to take a loss that year, so that we can we can we can save we can save jobs mm -hmm. and and ensure that our employees were loyal to us when times were good. What three things in in terms of of, of principles or values, um, what three people have contributed to your success, would you say? In terms of values? Yes, what three things in terms of values or professional or personal principles have contributed to your success? Uh, okay, that, that's good. Uh, our, one of my core values is integrity. Mm -hmm. I think that without that, you have nothing. Um, excellence is another one which I think we learned from where we are, where where we grew up. I think there's there is no excuse for not doing the best you could at all times, regardless of what the task was. And uh, um, I think. I'm trying to choose a third one that um, because there 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 are lots of um, values that I think are important. Our our, co our company has six core values, but also um, client service. Uh, the client is always right, mm -hmm. and I think that is something that differentiates our firm from a lot of other companies. We would do whatever it takes to keep you happy. And and those and that's the key client that we would like to maintain happy. So those are the three most important of of the six core values that we have. Those are the three that I would put at the top. Mm -hmm. um, Pamela Joseph said, um, as your business grew, what single event made you realize that you had the potential to compete with other businesses in South Florida and put a Cherokee on the map? One single event. Okay, let's see. Um, we were, there was a couple of years ago, like in the middle of the night, I got, we got a call that the Miami International Airport literally was on fire. They had a, a fueling facility and it was, they, that stored like 2 million gallons of jet fuel and it had exploded. We got a call from our client because we, we are the environmental engineer for that particular facility. And our, our, our firm was called among like four or five other firms to come and help them to get that situation under control. It was a major event. There was, uh, there was tennis going on. There was the ultra festival. There was a wine and food festival. There, was, there were a million things. And Miami International Airport is the hub of Miami-Dade County. So we got the fire under control, we got the environmental issues handled, and OSHA, which is Organization of Self and Self, uh, Self and Safety and Health Administration, they came down and they interviewed the five firms uh, that were on the site to determine who they would make the incident commander. And we were the smallest firm of the five firms, but we were the most qualified firm of the five firms. And they made us the incident commander. And that's when we recognized that we were forced to be reckoned with. And, uh, you know, we were up there with the big boys. So that, I think, opened our eyes as to what we had really become. What advice do you 
do you have for young women who are trying to follow your path? The, the, that they should just do it. Just have faith that they will succeed. Just have a faith, have the vision, have the, have the, have the fortitude, have the strength, have the discipline mm -hmm. that it takes to, um, to be successful. You just need to believe in yourself. It's great to get, have a mentor. It's great to have an advisor. It's good to talk to somebody who's been down that road. Um, but it really and truly, at some point, you go deep inside of yourself and really, 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 really want what it is that you want. And if, and if you do that, success is guaranteed. You know, for the, for the, for the young people who are listening tonight, I, I want to... I want to um, ask you to to spend some time, a little time on integrity, not not just as a moral construct, but as a universal principle in terms of punctuality and um, respect and returning people's calls and these sorts of things. How important are those? How important are those values within the construct of integrity to running a successful business? Um, very important to run in a successful business, very important to living a successful life. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's, it's more important to live a successful life. And if you, uh, uh, there are people, I, I, I can tell you if somebody's going to be successful. I'm dealing with you in this whole, um, you know, trying to put this whole thing together. It was just, it, it was so easy for me to pick it up right away. You did what you said you were going to do when you said you were going to do it. That was it. Wow. And that's what integrity is all about. If you said you're going to be here at 8 o'clock, then show up at 7.55. If you say you are going to do something, do it. And if you're not going to do it, just you need to say it. You just need to be. You need to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To be honest. With yourself, you need to be honest with the people that you're dealing with, and it's and it's really really important. When people, when when young people come to interview, uh, and there's some of them that I know that we would not hire because of of a lot of things. You know, they came, they're not properly dressed, they have, um, you know, they're not properly attired, they showed up late, their their resume is a mess. And, 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 and on and on and on and on and I can tell that, that we interview them and and I take the time to tell them and I know one of these days I'll probably get into trouble because somebody's going to sue me but I take the time to tell them especially if it's somebody that I think that has come from a disadvantaged socioeconomic environment and I, and I take the time to try to correct them I said you know these are the things that you need to do the next time you go for an interview you need to do this, 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 and this. It's, these are the things that you did wrong. And I say a, a silent prayer that they understand that what I'm trying to do is help them and, the, and, and, they, and it doesn't come back to bite me. But integrity is the number one. There, 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 there are no substitutes. That is the number one. Mm -hmm. How do you how do, how do you keep yourself going when things get rough, Christine? How do I keep myself going when things get rough? Yes. When things get rough, ooh, I meditate. Mm. I sit and I meditation has really helped me transform my life. But I sit and I and I and I and I don't fight against the moment. Mm -hmm. The moment is happening as it is, and it is as it, as it should be. So every time I feel that stress level coming on, I realize that what I'm doing is I'm fighting against this particular moment. And once I stop and I catch myself and I take my deep breath and I go into myself and I figure, let it be. Um, you know, like today is the law of least effort for me, and um, and that's and that's 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 how I do to ground myself. 
and to prevent myself from becoming overwhelmed, overstressed. It's not, it's not about what I can do. It's about what this moment requires. And this moment requires me to let it be. Christine, what is it, uh, with all the awards and accomplishments, what is it these awards and accomplishments are not telling us about you? They're not telling you that, that I'm really very uncomfortable with, about those awards and accomplishments. And that I'm, I'm, I'm normally a very humble person and I'm very nondescript and I like to live a, a simple and uh, a life where there's not, I mean, I don't want to be recognized and pat on, uh, be patted on the back. I say this while I'm sitting in front of um, in front of a camera, um, spouting all of the stuff that I do. But at the, but I'm doing this for a particular reason. Hopefully that you know there's something that I have learned along the way that I can pass on mm -hmm. uh, to whoever's listening. But generally, I'm I am who I am. I'm just I'm just I'm a just humble Christine from Guyana who <laughs> happened to be here at this time. Trevor, Trevor, in, in the chat room, Trevor asked, how does it feel to be a leader in a traditionally male-dominated environment? <laughs> ah, that is, that is a good question. And uh, all my partners are male. And uh, I have somehow emerged as the leader of this group. And I say emerged because we started off as... Um, as a, you know, a homo homogenous group with... with um, with operating truly by consensus. And then over the period of the time, people started to look to me as the person that had the vision, had the, had the, had the energy hmm. to, to move the, f the firm forward. So how does it feel? I, it, to tell you the truth, I'm, it doesn't feel anyway. I think it is because I went to a girl's school, which has its you know, pros and cons, and um, I think that is basically what has helped me to just accept leadership roles without even thinking about, well, you know, I'm a woman. I, I just dealt with women for a very important part of my life. So, mm -hmm. Brenda Richards asked, what would you like your legacy to be? <laughs> Brenda is very prolific with these questions. Thank you. Uh, uh, my legacy, my legacy, which I hope doesn't happen too soon, but um, I would like to leave a legacy of service. Mm -hmm. I would like people to say that I have used all of the talents that I, were, I was endowed with when I came into this world. And I've used them to make the world a better place than it was when I came, when I got here. That's what I want my legacy to be. Roxanne, so Christine, you said that your client is always right, but we all know that is not always true. How do you deal with clients who are simply not right? How do you tell them that gently? Ooh. <laughs> That's a tough one, actually. Um, no, the clients are not necessarily always right, but you have to find out, you have to find out where they're coming from. What is their viewpoint and how did they get there? And if you can understand the issue from their point of view and try to see how, how they got there, what their point of view is, then if there's no way that you can accept what it is they're saying, then I think there's, there has to be some way for you to convince them that they're wrong. 
it's very I have not necessarily been able to do that well um, we have a situation right now where uh, where the where the client wants us to implement a solution that we know that's not going to work for them but they're they're gung-ho on on using this particular method um, we have tried we've we've we, we, we understood where it is they they want to do it and they have a reason other than a genuine reason it is a political reason and once we understand understood that and we understand that the client is not right sometimes you have to for the sake of your own integrity walk away from the from the job and if it's not something that you can live with, then that's a client that you probably need to fire. What leadership qualities do you most admire, Christine? Uh, uh, no, I guess the ones you most admire are the ones that you probably don't have yourself. So... The ones, the one that I most admire, and I think it's one that I, I, I am developing and developing over time, is is the ability to empathize mm -hmm. with the people that you're leading, and the ability to let them be who they are. Everyone came into this world with a life, with a purpose, and it may not necessarily be my purpose, and it may not necessarily be what I want them to do, but they have their purpose. They have their reason for being here and they have their own path that they need to follow and um, as a leader you 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 need to recognize that and you need to let them follow their path hopefully it aligns with yours and, and, and the direction that you want to go in what is one thing about you Christine that most people do not know you believe might surprise them huh <laughs> One thing about me that most people do not know that I am that I can be very vulnerable. I come across as this tough iron lady sometimes, and with these broad shoulders, and I can handle most things. But there, there are times when I, I'm as weak as as anybody, and and I need the shoulder to cry on, and I need the person to lean on, and I need, and I need. I need help. So I think most people don't see that because they just see this this tough cookie, but sometimes I'm, I'm not as tough as I look. Let me go to the chat room again. Uh, Naz Nazima London asked, how many employees do you have and how are you able to keep a happy median with everyone? Employees, I think right now we're probably like in the mid 50s mm -hmm. and uh, the second part of the question was how are we able to keep a happy median with everyone a happy medium with everyone uh, we try first is we, we, we define our culture or we know the, the employee that fits into our culture mm -hmm. so we try not to hire people who do not fit into our culture that's the first part of it and then to keep a happy medium is we keep open communication. Uh, we try not to get too far. I, we try not to get too far away from our employees. Uh, we have a pretty um, our management style is not hierarchical. Everybody is empowered to do what's best for the client, and um, and we try to meet fairly regularly, at least once every quarter. And uh, the, the person, the managers, the officers in charge of a particular department, they're supposed to at least go out once a month and make and, and touch bases with everybody. And we have frequent feedback sessions. Mm -hmm. So, like I said, we try to run our firm and, uh, as a large company and, and, and also as a family. So that's how we keep keep people as happy as possible, as happy as you can be within the family. Okay. Uh, Pamela Joseph, do you have a vision for developing a consultancy aimed at helping other women to develop their business potential? 
Uh, ultimately, um, ultimately, that's what I want to do uh, when I transition from this business. Um, and, uh, you know, our intention is, I think, either to pass it on to the managers who are coming up. Um, that is that is my big, that's, that's my wish to one of these days start a company that um, can help other companies, not only women owned companies, but small and medium sized businesses uh, through some of the issues that I have gone through. And I wish that I had somebody to help me through those some of the landmines and and how to make it, you know, what it what it takes for to, to success, what it really or you really need to have to have a successful company. And um, one of those, uh, I think, is, is most most importantly, you need to have a, at least identify your core competencies. Mm -hmm. And if I can help a firm with strategic planning and to identify those issues and to help them down the path of success, that would, that would really, I think, be the way I would like to end my career. Malcolm, Malcolm said, great advice for our young people. Cheryl, being a best-in-class performer, what would you say is your greatest strength? If you had to repeat your professional journey, drawing from your experience, what is one thing you would do differently? What is, what is one thing I would do differently? Mm -hmm. uh, hmm. That's a tough question. These are tough questions. Uh, one thing I would do differently is probably we started off with um, there. We started off with three partners, and we're now up to five partners. I would probably um, have added more partners uh, much, much, much more quickly, because I find what happens is is when you when when somebody has a vested interest in in the firm their whole their whole mind changes and the people that we added as partners a couple of years ago they have added such tremendous value to the firm as a partner they were really good employees but as partners they have they have tremendously increased the value of our firm so i think what i would do differently is once once we identify people who are truly assets to our company then we need to reward them with partnership um, much more quickly than we did. I'll ask you this question and take a break, and when we come back, you can answer it. What was one of the most challenging or painful decision or professional decision you've ever made? Okay. All right. I'll think about it. back with a lovely Christine Franklin. Christine, the question before the break is, um, what was the most difficult or challenging, what was the most challenging or painful professional decision you've ever made? That was firing our construction manager in the middle of one of the biggest and most important construction projects that we had. And we were on a tight, tight, tight deadline over budget, but he did something that was so unethical that there was no way that we could, I could not fire him. And uh, I remember uh, one of my partners asking if we can just keep him until the end of the project, but we couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I couldn't, we couldn't as a firm have a core value of integrity. And just briefly, I'll tell you what he did. We, um, we had a project that there's a Buy America Act where you have to put American made materials in it and he had put Chinese products in it. And because it was hidden from the from the client 
And he had told the construction crew that if anybody talked, they would be fired. And I just had gone to this job site on Thanksgiving, just the day before Thanksgiving Day, because we give out um, these turkey cards. And the person who was supposed to deliver wasn't there, so I, I decided I was going to do them myself. And when I got to the job site, the guys were, were, were very antsy. They were jumpy. And, and I kept saying, is everything all right? And everybody said, no, they're fine. I said, well, if everything's not all right, so, you know, give me a call. I'm, I'm here. I'm always here. And, you know, you can trust me. So as I was driving away, somebody called me and told me what happened. And um, the decision was we had to rip everything out of there, which was hundreds of thousands of dollars. Hire the construction, fire the construction manager, and try to get the job finished on time, or else we were facing liquidated damages of thousands of dollars a day. Mm. And it was just, in addition to the fact that it was a core value, it was just an example to everybody that we would always do the right thing. And so that was difficult. We lost a lot of money in the project, but it, it was just something that we had to do. Do you have a favorite hobby, and, and if so, what is it? A hobby? Yeah, I don't really have time for a hobby that much, but um, I do things. Uh, I play the bells. At, at, um, I play the handbells at church, and I love to sing in the choir. Um, the, well, one of my car mates is the person that, that told you um, about me, uh, Gina. Um, what else do I do? I guess I don't do much. I, I, I tend to my mother's garden. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something that she did before she died, and I, I struggled to keep it alive, but there's somewhere, I think her spirit is out there somewhere because it, it's still, I mean, everything is still living. Uh, I do a lot, but I, in terms of a hobby, I don't have anything that I do. I, I have to go into the chat room because I saw a very interesting statement by Brenda. And it ties in with what you just said. So let me let me go, go in the chat room for a second. Roxanne asked, after having achieved so much professionally, is there room or even a need for a healthy and successful marriage? Healthy and successful what? Marriage. Marriage? Mm -hmm. Okay, Brenda. No, that's not Brenda. That's not Brenda. Who is that? That's Roxanne. Who? Roxanne. Roxanne, oh my gosh, she, um, you know, I am sure that um, there is, there is room, there's always room for a successful marriage. I, I know that we are kind of hardwired to, to want a mate, to to, to have somebody there who is, who is there for you. And, um, and we all want that. Um, it would have to be somebody who understands that, uh, that, that I have a life that requires that a lot of my time and my energy might have to go into that periodically and that you know, they, they, they don't feel as though they're being ignored or or not loved. So, and, and you know, that's, and that's, that's, that's kind of difficult mm -hmm. for me right now. But I guess as I slow down a bit, I can, I can, um, I can consider getting married and, again. And Brenda said, um, hope my revelation doesn't embarrass you, but I was hoping that you would have revealed when asked that the thing most do, um, most do not know about you is that you are a vital and talented part of your church choir. I, I am not, I am, I am maybe, I'm part, but I'm not vital. <laughs> if I, um, if I don't show up, that choir still functions. So vital is the choir director. <laughs> Or the or, or the organist. I am I'm a part of it, but it's I'm not a vital part. 
And GY to NY said, your approach to encouraging open relations between management and staff is remarkable, particularly in this era of more captains on deck than the crew. And based on what you said, it is not lip service. Karen G. Roxanne, what kind of question is that? Too funny. Everyone likes someone in their corner who has mm. their who has their back, is supportive mm. and caring. Um, if you were stranded on a desert, Christine, on a desert, right. on, a, on a desert island. What what three things would you want with you? I would want my iPhone. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Apple is probably like using this as a commercial. Uh, music. Music. Right. Reggae. And, uh, huh, it, it has to be things, it doesn't have to be people, right? Um, well, it's up to you. No, that's fine. <laughs> uh, what else? I, I, you're only, I can only pick three, so I have to be careful about this third one. A bottle of fine wine. A bottle of fine wine, okay. How do you balance the demands of running a company with your personal life? I put everything in perspective. Mm -hmm. um, I hire people who should know what they're doing by now. I hire the best people. I pay them well. And that means that I don't have to work 24 hours a day. You know, I can make more money if I don't do that, but I, I prefer to make less money and make sure that I put people in place who. So I set, I set the stage where I work smart and mm -hmm. not necessarily hard. I've learned that over 15 years that that's what you do. If you and were, course, sorry, if you were given a second chance to choose your career, what would it be? I would be a counselor. Counselor, what? what? Yeah, no, I, I like what I do now, but I'd probably be a counselor because I find I, I like listening to people's problems and giving them advice. So I think I'd, I, I would, um, you know, I can see the forest for the trees, uh -huh. so I can detach myself, and, and I think I would be a counselor. So that's why I think I would make a good business consultant when I when I finally decide to go off on my own. And what what do you enjoy most about your job? I like, I like achieving. I like, I like growing. I like, I like accomplishing. I like the fact that, that, that we've, we've grown something that has become such a name in the community and so special and so recognized as a company of, um, of integrity. You know, like even the regulatory agencies, when when the fir when firms call and say, "Well, can you recommend a company that wouldn't um, wouldn't screw me over?" They call us. Uh, they 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 give them our name, and that's what I like most about it is to be able to to be to be recognized as as as, as a firm of integrity. Yeah. Cheryl, Cheryl L. joined late, but have been enlightened and impressed so far with what Christine has said. The last example she gave shows great management and the integrity of the person. And Roxanne said, to follow, on, to follow on from Brenda's comment, what part does God play in your life? God is, God is everything in my life. Um, I, I know God has always been an important part of my life and um, on and off it's you know you go through the stages where you feel that you're in control mm -hmm. and I think um, I always tell people that um, there's a saying that if you want to make God laugh tell him your plans <laughs> and if I had um, I have plans for my life, 
and and this certainly wasn't it. Where I am today, this was not it. And 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 God had different plans for me. Mm-hmm. And God is really very. It's everything in my life. It, it is. Um, it is some. It is a place that I've come back to, after being away for it for for very long, and it's just a place that. I have to once again thank my mother. Like I said, going through her illness and. Um, suffering through the pain of, 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 of her of her dying and her death um, just gave me the faith that, that there's something bigger and, and, mm-hmm. and more more wonderful mm-hmm. and that's and that's that's the force that's inside of me and outside of me and that's God for a woman or, or anyone starting their own business, what are the three most critical things for them to be aware of, you believe? They, um, they, need to have, um, they need to have a plan. They need to know what it is they want to do, why they want to do it. And, and like I said, starting a business is easy to start a business. It, you have to have, you have to know how it is that you are different from your competition, what it is that you provide that would not make you a commodity in, in two weeks or two months or two years, because it's very easy to start a business. It's very easy to, to end it, to, to be run out of business because you don't have that knowledge of what it is that you, how you differentiate yourself. And you have to also know how you're going to finance your how you can take care of your personal finances. Because if you have to worry about how you're going to pay your rent, how you're going to eat, how your children are going to um, survive, then your business is not going to be successful. Mm-hmm. And um, third is, it's always, it's always easier to start a business with partners. I think it it makes life easier. You can you can distribute the load. It's but it's also important to choose a partner that you completely absolutely trust. Mm. So those I think would be the three most important things. If you want to start a business, for me, if I had to do it all, all over again, uh, I start a new business. I would I would have to consider those three to be the most important. What 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 traditions did you grow up with that? That have that may have contributed to you being so driven. Traditions. Hmm. Well, in our well, there is always work to be done in our house. Yes. So <laughs> that that's so is. Um, and that's a good one. That's all, um, that's always uh, something that that drives you to 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 want to complete it so that you can that you can run out there and play. Um, I had to I had to help my mom with her. She she was a school teacher, and I had to help her with her homework with 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 grading papers and. Uh, seeing you know seeing the differences of um, accomplishment um, among the students and listening to her t- tell me which which ones of them you know she thought would be successful based upon how hard they worked and so to me when I saw that I figured you know the harder you work the, the, the more it is that you can achieve success uh, in terms of another tradition I I can't think of anything that helped me be I think I just came out of the room wanting to accomplish something. I like that. And I've always I've always worked my butt off. You you attended Bishop's High School in Guyana. Uh-huh. Uh, which has shaped many high achievers and leaders. Are there any principles you learned as a student there that still resonate with you? Of course. Um, 
The one that, of course, we all know is what, whatsoever the hand fight it to do, do it with all their might. That, to me, is the single most statement mm -hmm. that has contributed to everything I do successfully. Uh, when I came to the U.S., right, uh, the, you know, you come to the country. I was I was an engineer when I got here. I was not a professional engineer. I couldn't work as an engineer. So, you worked. Uh, I worked as a receptionist. I worked as a telemarketer. I did whatever it took to earn an income while I, um, you know, went back to school and got all of the credentials that I needed to to be successful. But it didn't matter what it was that I was doing. I just had to do it to the best of my ability. Mm -hmm. And it didn't take long for wherever I was, for people to recognize that, that, that excellence. So it would take two weeks, a month, three months, you know, and then I would just be promoted up the ladder. And I, you know, you really couldn't tell anybody how qualified you were because there was no way you could get a job if they knew that. You're going to leave in, in 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 a few months or a few years, but that singular statement is the one that I think is most contributed to who I am today. Mm -hmm. And everything I do, I touch. Everything I touch, I touch that way. And I look around me with everybody who I have seen who has been successful, and that's the way that they view life. If there's one, can you share with us your secret indulgence? My secret? Indulgence. Indulgence. Mm -hmm. huh. If there is one. Oh, I'm sure. Everybody has a secret indulgence. Uh, my secret indulgence. Yeah. I like fried chicken. <laughs> I like fried chicken wings. God. Okay. Those are good. Um, when are you most happy? I am most happy when I'm surrounded by the people that I love very much. Uh, my niece, my nephews, my extended family, my goddaughters. Um... Every Christmas Eve night, I have this Christmas Eve dinner where I invite all of the people that I love to celebrate the birth of Christ, and we have this wonderful dinner in in my home. And to me, that's the happiest occasion every what, year. What is gratifying about being Christine Franklin? What is gratifying for what is gratifying Christ about being Christine Franklin? that I think I have in my package everything that I need to be to be who I am mm -hmm. I, I, I came into the world as a full package and um, and I appreciate everything that I've been given let me go to the chat room for a second. Sorella said, any business book recommendations? What, what, what is on your reading list now? Uh, I have a lot of things that I'm reading. I'm, I'm reading a book called Transformational Speaking, and I'm going up to the Omega Institute to, to, um, to do a, a weekend workshop on that. But a good business book is and the business book that everyone should read, especially for people who are thinking of getting into business, is, some, is, a, book, is a book called Good to Great. Good what? Good to Great. Oh, Good to Great. Okay. Yes. And um, that is, um, it, it, it talks about how you differentiate the good companies from the great companies. And they studied a lot of the good companies and the great companies, and they just, they just, fine-tuned it and found some characteristics of the great companies. And, um, but you cannot get away from the fact that great companies 
hire great people. And um, what what are you most proud of? Most proud of. Well, other than the company that I helped form, which I think it's 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 my biggest achievement so far. Mm -hmm. And I am proud of who I've become, who I've evolved into mm -hmm. over the period of 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 everything that I've gone gone through, and at this stage of my life with with all of the experiences that I've had, that I've had, and the recent um, I'm trying to look for the, there were, you know, the, the recent sad events in my life that I have managed to come through it as a whole person. And I've managed to to take all of the, uh, everything that has been thrust upon me and transform them from, from challenges into opportunities. And it, it, it it's just has given me the opportunity to evolve into this, this strong, resilient person who, who is comfortable with who, finally comfortable with who I am. If you could go back, if you could go back in time, what will you tell fifteen-year-old Christine? Oh wow! I don't think she would listen, but I would tell her not to worry. Finish the sentence. Sorry, you. Sorry, did I no, cut? No, no. Okay. Finish the sentence for me. I look forward to Sunday evenings too. I look forward to Sunday evenings to kick back, relax, think about my my week ahead, and and do nothing. Do nothing. Let me go to the chat room again. Um, Cheryl L. Or who has who was her role model? Have you mentored anyone with the same aspirations? Okay. Uh, role model in terms of 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 a female role model, I I don't particularly have one. I have a, I do have a mentor who was my boss at at the last, last firm, mm -hmm. who helped me get into business and who is very succinct and very to the point, very dry. Call him up, what the problem is, and he very very immediately sees a solution that you couldn't have seen in a month of Sundays. I have mentored I've mentored a couple of people, a couple of, and I've mentored a couple of firms. I have I work with a company called um, Foster Construction. It's Adrian and her husband died quite suddenly and so she has depended on me for support and solace. Um, I have been the official mentor for uh, a s small CPA firm that was just starting up, and I was his mentor for a whole, for a year. That was set up by the uh, Florida Regional Minority Business Council by uh, a wonderful woman. Her name is Beatrice, who runs that company. Um, and from time to time, um, I, and I have mentors within the firm. There, are, there are people. In our firm that I'm mentoring, who who work directly for me, um, we have a mentorship program in in our company where everybody has to choose a mentor. I try not to um, to make myself available because, of course, I I would be everybody's best mentor because you know you have access to the top and you have access to to me. So mm -hmm. um, so I try not to be available. For, for more than one or two persons at a time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but I've mentored, I, I mentor people all the time. Colleen Lucas, Christine, I am very proud of you, especially as a fellow Guyanese. Many people have a bucket list. What is the thing you would like most to do in the near future? The thing I like to do most? In the near future. In the near future. 
huh, I am doing actually doing what I like very much. Um, and the very near future, I want to continue doing what I'm doing. Uh, we have um, we have big plans. We have really, really big plans for the future. Our our goal is to we have a we have a kind of boutique firm in in Florida in Miami. We have an office in uh, Miami. We have one in Fort Lauderdale. And our vision for our company is to recreate this model uh, throughout the United States and worldwide. Uh, and we started to do that. So we've identified two other locations that we want to grow into. So in the immediate future, that's what I want to do. In the long term, I do have intentions, like I said, of opening up another firm that um, strat helps um, small and medium-sized businesses with their business strategies. And Cheryl, Cheryl said, we know that regret is a useless emotion, but do you have any? Regrets. I guess I, yeah, regrets is a useless emotion because you can't do anything about it, about the past, mm -hmm. nor can you do anything that much about the future. You can only do much and something really about the present. Really the way to take care of the future, they say, is always to be in the present. But that being said, I guess if I had my life to live over, I probably would have a child. Mm -hmm. If um, I think I think I've seen my friends and their children and their people with grandchildren too, um, and it's 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 very gratifying, mm -hmm. and uh, that's probably one of the experiences that I missed. And Karen, of, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry about that. You were going yeah, to no, say that's fine. okay. And Karen G said that is a good book, and. GY to NY said, are you a member of WB, WBENC and or NMSDC? I am a member of FRMBC and that, which is Florida Regional Minority Business Council, and they are a member of the National Minority Supply Development Council. So I'm a member through being a member of the regional organization. Um, the... And uh, I am an alumni. The NSNBC actually gave me a scholarship to go to Kellogg, which was ugh, such an incredible experience um, for a week, the Advanced School of Management. And um, so I'm an alumni of that of that um, of that program. So and they, that alumni, um, that organization that we meet once a year in some part of the country. You know, Christine, time has a way of sneaking up on us on this show. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I have to come to our last question, which I ask every one of my guests. What makes you laugh out loud? <laughs> what makes me laugh out loud? I, I sh that's um, that's uh, laughter is the echo of the soul. Is that what is on your website? That, that's, that's my mantra, yes. Laughter is the <laughs> echo of the soul. Um, when I'm... When I'm happy, when I'm with my, my with my with my people, <laughs> with, with with my with my with my spars, my my girls, and we're just sitting around doing, you know, all talking, having a good time, reminiscing, having a glass of wine, and we chuckle for for old time's sake. Christine. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us I this evening. I should say thank you, Sawin. You, this, you're an amazing, amazing interviewer. This has been a wonderful show. I think what you're doing is incredible. And I know, I know you've been tremendously successful. I know this is going to go so far that we will say that we know him. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> that is indeed an honor coming from you, really. Thanks so much. And I really enjoyed this conversation. You've been candid and eloquent and wonderful. And I am so glad that Gina introduced us and you took the time to come on to CWS. Thank you so very much, Christine.
You are so kind. Thank you very much. All right. Good night. Good night.